What makes a story truly scary? Is it the plot? Or maybe it's the characters, the text, the subtext, the voice of the narrator. Tonight, I present to you some of the best stories that I've created on the Dark Waters channel. Some of you may have heard these stories before, and that's fine. For those of you who listen to every single thing on this channel, I have plenty more coming down the pipeline. But for those of you who are new here, and you quite haven't had the opportunity to fully indulge in the delicacy of horror that we present at the Dark Waters channel, this is for you. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. About eight years ago, I used to own an occult bookshop. And if you were standing behind a checkout counter, it faced the front door. It was around noon, and there were a few customers checking out. My employee Stephanie and I were helping customers when I noticed a man in a light spreader walk into the store. He looked normal, but he was looking down at the ground when he walked in the door. After he entered, he walked a few steps towards the bookshelves, and he lifted his head up a bit, and I caught a glimpse of the side of his face. Then he turned his head and looked directly at me like he knew I was watching. His eyes were black as midnight. Man, I was shocked, and I just stared at him. My body felt like I was hit with some kind of bolt of electricity and my knees weakened. Stephanie noticed my condition and literally grabbed me before I fell to the floor. As I gathered my composure, I told her I was okay. I figured that my blood sugar had dropped and I needed to get something to munch on. So I turned my back and walked to the small table behind the counter. That's when I heard Stephanie saying, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. When I turned around, this black eyed man was standing behind the counter only a few feet away from me, dared directly at me, not saying a word. I was so frightened that I ran towards the steps and up into my office, hoping he'd not follow me. That's when I heard Stephanie tell him, look, I'm about to call the police if you don't leave. I stayed in the office for a few minutes, and that's when Stephanie came walking up the steps, and I asked her, hey, did he leave? And she said he was gone. After that, I told her to close the store for the rest of the day. It was a terrible experience and I literally feared for my life. I haven't seen any other black eyed people since then, but I was so affected by that encounter that I decided to sell my business right afterwards. People always ask me, well, why did you decide to do that? But something told me I didn't need to be in the occult business anymore. As a young man, I grew up in the Philippine Islands. My father was a well-known man and we had the run of the town there called Naga. Now in those days, Naga was nothing more than a small city. It hadn't blossomed into the tourist destination that it is today. My friends and I had unrestricted access to all the local bars and pool halls due to the status of my father and his associates. With the exception of the Yakuza and a few crooked military officers, we had no issues at all. This combination of unlimited access and freedom often led to us getting into a world of trouble. Now, one evening I decided to take a small boat and bring my girlfriend to one of the uninhabited islands for us some time alone. We left around noon and slowly worked our way over to the small island with a few blankets, some food, and some beer. When we arrived, we set up just off the beach under some trees for shade. The day had gone exactly how I wanted it to, and as the sun started to go down, I began to gather some firewood. Now, she was leery of spending the night and really wanted to go, but I was able to persuade her to relax, and we decided to stay the night along the beach. We were laying there, looking up at the stars, and talking, the sounds of the waves crashing ashore were so peaceful that I kind of fell asleep. Now, I couldn't tell you what time it was, but at some point, she got spooked and began slapping and beating me on my stomach and chest. Did you hear that? Honestly, I was dead to the world. The perfect weather and the waves had produced the best sleep I've had in years. But that's when I started to hear the sound of someone crying coming out of the woods behind us. Now, this island was small, very small, and during the day, I had walked the entire area looking for firewood. No one was here. The crying got louder and louder until we both saw. It looked like a woman in a white dress walking towards us through the woods. Now my first thought 
was to get the fuck out of there. But breaking my uncle's boat was not an option. On the way in, we had to dodge some jagged rocks and reefs, so navigating the waters at night would have been nearly impossible. The cry stopped all of a sudden, and the woman disappeared. My girlfriend was now freaking out and crying. I tried everything I could to comfort her, telling her to lay down with me. Everything would be fine. So we both laid back down and tried to let go of the fear we were feeling. Now just as my heart, which had been racing uncontrollably, began to calm down, I saw something dart from one of the trees to the other. I rolled to my left, hugging her, pulling her close to my body so that her face was in my chest. What I saw next made packing up and taking the risk of driving the boat at night seem a whole lot more reasonable. As I pulled her body close to mine, lying right behind her was the same figure of an old woman. She was still wearing that old white dress, and it was as if I had pulled my girlfriend's body from right out of her. She had these bloodshot eyes and, and long black hair, and on her forehead was a scar as if someone had just stabbed her with a sharp object in the center of her head. She just stared at me with this cold, dead look in her eyes. The whole while this was going on, the constant sound of the waves crashing ashore was absent. I felt as if this woman had been there a long time, and to her, we were more than just people. We were away off of this island. My gaze into her eyes was broken by my girlfriend kicking away a small bug from her feet, and I seized that moment to stand up, pull her to her feet, and I grabbed everything I could and we headed back to the boat. I could not see much when we did launch the boat, so I got just beyond the area to where the waves began to break into calmer water and anchored. We spent the rest of the night there and navigated the rocks back towards Naga at sunrise. Last month, while visiting my family in Destin, Florida, I witnessed something that should not have been possible. My cousin Lynn and I were in her room watching YouTube while our moms were out back drinking wine poolside. Lynn decided to download a Ouija board app on her iPad. Personally, I am not into that kind of stuff, so I just moved over to the other side of the room while she sat there asking this electronic Ouija board questions. I did my best to ignore her, putting my earbuds in and listening to some music. Her lips were moving as if to ask questions to the e-Ouija board, and her face showed a look of disappointment. Assuming her little experiment was not going well, I excused myself and went to the bathroom down the hall, then went downstairs to talk to my mom and aunt at the poolside. When I returned to the room an hour later, she was already in bed under the covers, which was weird for Lynn. She was more of a night owl. She never went to bed early. I was a bit tired, so I crawled in my sleeping bag on the floor next to her bed and went to sleep to the sounds of waves crashing against the rocks on YouTube. At 3 a.m., I was awakened by the sounds of vomiting. It was Lynn standing at the foot of her bed and projectile vomiting all over her comforter. She looked pale and weak, the complete polar opposite to the teenager that I had just saw before I went to bed. We called an ambulance thinking she must have food poison. The rest of the story is what my auntie told my mother when we reached the hospital. See, my mom and I drove the car while they both were in the back of the ambulance. She said Lynn had to be restrained, and she began talking in a strange voice and in a totally different language. She broke out of the restraints, and then they had to sedate her. She said it was almost like Lynn had been possessed. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head, and she let out violent sounds and roars. Lynn spent four days in the hospital, and she's now back home. But my auntie claims that she's just not the same little girl.
I was born in Cuba and I have been rolling cigars for 20 years. When you ask me about the strange things that happened to me when I was a young girl, it's taken me some time. I am quite nervous. I have known you for 13 years, but I am still scared to talk about the things that have happened to me. During my teenage years, my mother and father both worked for a cigar manufacturing company. So this is actually how my start as an apprentice roller. Well, the floor manager was a very mean and cantankerous, hateful man. He would do the most random things to people just to make their lives miserable. I can remember when he threatened to fire my mother because she would not show him her breasts. And he did this in front of my father who was completely livid. However, in my country, cigar rollers are the upper middle class. So there was nothing or little anyone would do to jeopardize their job. So my father had no choice but to let it slide. This man took full advantage of countless women, forcing them to perform sexual favors and even into prostitution for tourists that would visit the country illegally. Eventually, he got mixed up with a group of Sicilian mobsters and he was killed. But just before that happened, he turned his evil gaze upon me. And at that time, I was 16. One morning, as I swept the factory floors, he called me into his office. I will never forget that moment. My heart sank into my chest and I knew he was going to try something. He, now, he didn't smoke the cigars we rolled. He would smoke the actual leaves themselves. And when I walked in, he was just standing there, leaning on the desk, smoking a rolled up tobacco leaf with his pants unzipped. My mind raced as I tried to figure out what to do and instinctively I sneezed, blowing mucus out of my nose across the room and it landed on the floor at his feet. This enraged him and he charged forward slapping me and telling me to clean it up. So as I got down on the floor and cleaned it with the bottom of my apron, he circled to the back side of the desk and took a seat and he began talking. This man said the most offensive things about my father, how he was not a man and that he had slept with my mother. Then he said, hmm, your mother was good, but I will have you next. You just wait, your turn is coming. Two days later, he was murdered by a mobster who was in love with one of the girls in the factory. So that day, everyone <laughs> was in a celebratory mood, especially my father. So for a moment there, it felt as if the darkness that he represented was gone. But unfortunately, that feeling would not last long. Two days later, one of the bunches, for those of you who don't know, a buncher is the person who gathers the tobacco and uh, organizes it for the day. They have to get to the factory at 5 a.m and start work three hours earlier than everyone else. Anyway, when we arrived, she was in a corner hiding and she said there was a shadow in the manager's office with glowing red eyes watching her. Now this poor girl was completely out of her head and her hands were shaking and her eyes were darting from left to right as if she was seeing this thing again and again. As the days progressed, the dark shadow was seen everywhere in the office and panic began to set in as people brought crosses and holy water to work. On a Friday night, I was in bed and I had just fallen asleep when I began to get this horrible feeling. My skin began to tingle and burn at the same time. And when I opened my eyes, that black shadow was hovering above me. I felt its hands touching my body on my breasts and on my inner thighs and when I tried to scream nothing came out. Those piercing red eyes stared back at me as I felt my body being groped. So I prayed to the Virgin Mary to help me and then it went away. But for the next two years I was visited off and on by this entity 
and things got so bad that my mother began to sleep in the same bed with me. But it would not stop. It only targeted her too. This shadow was the spirit of the evil manager and he had followed many women home from the factory. So my father had a priestess come to the house and perform a ritual to banish this evil spirit from our home. We were saved, but many other women continued to be harassed. That activity went on until I was 25 years old. At that point, I moved to America and have been living in New Orleans ever since. Police Department and I've been on the force for 20 years. I've been assigned to a special unit that very few people know about. I've been tasked along with my partner to deal with the more supernatural type of events that happen in the city of New Orleans. This story is about one of those events. Three years ago there were a number of complaints about a satanic coven operating in the city of New Orleans. They use local cemeteries to do rituals and seances. Along with that, there were complaints about hearing loud dog barks and howls coming out of the same cemeteries. One evening, a call came across my radio about such an event, and I headed over to the cemetery to check it out. This particular evening, I was alone. My partner had taken some vacation time, and I entered the cemetery not expecting to see much. In fact, I had busted the majority of these satanic cults in action, and I knew everyone by name. I didn't take it personally. I'm a Christian. They don't choose to worship Satan. That's their thing. They can go straight to hell. This particular night, I walked up on a seance, and everyone stopped. But they had this weird look in their eyes. They all looked spooked. Now, I figure if you're sitting there in the cemetery worshiping Satan, you should be spooked. So, I think nothing of it. After all, we're in the cemetery at night. All right, guys, break it up. Break it up. It's time for you to get out of here. You know you're trespassing. Don't make me arrest you. The entire group just stood there. Looking at me, but not looking at me. More so looking through me. Or, dare to say, looking past me. They stood there frozen with this terrified look on their faces. Guys, you heard me. Break it up. It's time to get out of here. Again, none of them moved. They just stood there. Dawned in their black robes and red robe belts. They all stood there frozen. For the first time, I began to feel a chill down my spine. And I had an urge to look behind me. Everything told me not to turn around. But I did. What I saw when I turned around could only be described as a hellhound. The hellhound had a face of an overgrown Doberman Pinscher. Its head was huge. Its eyes were a deep glowing reddish color. And it was large. Much larger than my 200 pound Rottweiler. What really disturbed me was that it appeared to be ghostly and solid at the same time. Almost as if it existed in the realm between the living and the dead. It stood there ready to pounce as I maneuvered my way among the members of the group. Reaching for my weapon, the leader, a woman named Catherine, quietly said, This is just a warning. Don't do anything and we'll be fine. But if you shoot, it will attack. At this point, I never had any experience with this type of entity, so I had no clue what to do. And I trusted her. For some reason, I did. She then threw what looked like a bag of powder in the direction of the hellhound. A barking sound began to emanate from all around us, but not from the hellhound itself. This sound, these sounds, seemed as if they were coming from below us and above us, 
almost like from another dimension or another world. Then the hellhound let out a sound that was not a bark, but more of a demonic roar. The sound was otherworldly. Then it simply disappeared before our eyes. This was the first encounter I had with the hellhound, but wouldn't be the last. I walked the group out of the cemetery and questioned Catherine about the incident. She said that some of the ceremonies that they hold, hellhounds show up expecting to collect the human soul. It was a sign that the ritual had worked. This job has led me down some dark paths and forced me to befriend some weird and strange people, but I take comfort in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That sound brought me out of my kitchen, down the hallway, into the living room, where my wife was standing there, staring at the front door, looking like she'd seen a ghost. Baby, what the hell was that? You see, that sound was coming through the radio inside of our home. The sound of a little kid, over static, asking us to let him in. Prior to me going in the kitchen, my wife decided to go answer the front door. I thought nothing of it. It was just 6 p.m. It was light outside. There was nothing for us to be afraid of. But I was wrong. As I stood behind her, she was frozen, staring at the door handle. I said, babe, what's wrong? Who's outside? What is that noise? What's that sound? She wouldn't speak. I reached to open the door, turning the handle, and as I opened the door, there standing before me were two little boys, no older than 12 years old, staring directly at me with eyes that were black voids. They seemed to have a mesmerizing effect on me. They said, let, me let us in. in. I need to use the phone. Let me in. Let me in. <laughs> Every ounce of my body you. told me not to let them in. And I will kill you. But for some reason, she I found my hand moving up to signal to let them into the house. My wife grabbed my hand and pulled it back to my side. You wanna play hide and seek? Let us in. Let us in you now. We need to use your phone. <laughs> let us in now. <laughs> my wife slammed the door shut and went and closed all the curtains and blinds. They were out there for a little while, saying, let us in. My days working as a social worker let here in New Orleans now. have been filled with Please, significant highs in. and dismal gut rich I dialed 911 and told the New Orleans overall, Police Department that there were two I'm enjoyed my job trying to break with into one our exception. Home. When the cops arrived, they were gone. There was this one case I'm very that I worry about opening my front door was now. completely terrifying. I'm not sure who or what they were. I was I called out to evaluate the condition of a 13-year-old little know girl about named these Taylor. Black-eyed children. The reports were that she was having irrational and violent behavior and had been experiencing extreme psychotic episodes. Pulling up to the house, I knew something was incredibly wrong. It was springtime here in New Orleans. All the yards of the neighborhood were beautiful with these bright green colors but this house this house nothing in the yard was alive all the grass was dead and the single tree that sat in the front lawn was withered and brown getting out of the car my first thought was what the fuck is wrong with this place soon I would learn that this was only a reflection 
of the horror that was going on inside of the house. As I entered the home, my nose was overwhelmed with the most powerful smell of bleach I'd ever smelled in my life. I tried to ignore it as I moved to the sofa to talk to Taylor's mother. Her mom began to explain to me what the family had been experiencing over the past 12 months and her eyes filled with water as she told me about her daughter's sudden change in behavior. You see, Taylor had made a new friend who was a self-proclaimed witch and he had been repeatedly playing with a Ouija board. Now these sudden changes in Taylor's behavior had led to problems in her mother's marriage, anger management issues for her younger brother, and physical ailments that range from migraines to severe back spasms for her mother. Looking into this woman's eyes, she seemed to be struggling with PTSD, and I wanted to meet the little girl who caused all this drama. Her mother timidly led me down to the end of the hallway and to the closed door of Taylor's room. I noticed that there was this small, crude, homemade lock on the exterior of her bedroom door. Eye bolts had been screwed into the door frame and into the door, and a small metal hook was dangling from one of the eye bolts. Now this really made me feel uneasy, because I knew now something surely was going on in this house, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Someone here was dangerous for sure and was definitely out of control. I wasn't sure if it was Taylor or her mother or her brother or her father, but someone was completely out of control. Opening the door to the bedroom removed all doubts as to who was the problem in this house. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you couldn't believe what your eyes were showing you? When what you're looking at is so unreal that you have to shake your head to express your mental confusion this girl is laying on her back her feet facing the headboard with her neck positioned just enough so her head would be hanging off the bottom of the mattress forcing her to look at me upside down and as I walked into the room she began to do this freaky ass shit where she slid her legs up and down and smiling and said mommy who is this who is this man her mother just looked at me with this helpless look in her eyes, and I introduced myself. I'm Mr. Young. My job is to see what I can do to help you. Help me? Why do I need help? She asked in the most innocent, childlike tone I'd ever heard. Well, it has come to my attention that you may be experiencing some problems. Do you want to talk about them? Then she began this freaky double talk problems problems no no I have no problems this little girl was giving me a serious case of the creeps everything in my body was telling me to leave this house and forget about this case try and get it assigned to someone else just get the hell out of here I decided to back out of there it was all a bit too much for me at this point in time and I had made my initial assessment something was definitely wrong with her Taylor well, I just wanted to introduce myself to you and say hello. I'll be back soon so we can talk some more, okay? Again, she hit me with this creepy double talk. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Don't hit the puppy dogs. They're so cute. Now, at this time, I wanted out of the house. I intended to get the hell out of there. So I told her mother I would schedule an appointment with them later this week. Walk into my car. I was thinking about what she said to me and the look in this girl's face and her eyes. It was really unsettling. I had been in rooms with convicted murderers, pedophiles, rapists, all types of seedy people, but this 13-year-old girl was scaring me. Driving away from the house, there was this feeling of relief, as if I had just left some type of evil bubble that was surrounding me. I turned on the Claiborne Avenue and headed downtown. As I accelerated down the street, I found myself staring at the white lines. My attention drifted away from what I was doing, and when I looked up, a woman was racing out into the street trying to catch her two dogs. Slamming on the brakes as I swerved to avoid them and her, in the back of my mind, I could hear Taylor's creepy voice saying, don't hit the puppies, 
they're so cute this is exactly how my first visit to this home ended me sitting there on claiborne avenue freaking out over what just happened my second and final visit to the house was the most horrific experience i've had to this day this time when i entered the house i could smell the stench of feces in the air taylor's mother was sitting on the sofa and only a few days had gone by but she looked extremely weak and drained and was having trouble walking. Her brother who opened the door had a black eye and scratches on his face. In the house, it looked like a war zone. Dirty dishes in the kitchen, chicken bones on the floor. The paintings on the wall were all tilted in various directions as if someone had been beaten on the walls. And the paintings of Jesus Christ and Mary that once hung on a wall by the fireplace had been scratched and torn. This house felt alive and had a different energy, way more different than the first time I visited. Walking down the hallway to Taylor's room, I noticed that not only was the door open, but the eye bolts had been ripped out of the door in a door frame. Taylor was standing there, half naked, with her hands on the wall, smearing feces everywhere. The smell was putrid and it made me nauseous. As I stood there covering my nose, I realized that this wasn't just a regular mental breakdown. This was something way more sinister. When she saw me, she waved her hands and said, I told you to watch out for the puppies. Aren't they so cute? Then she continued to smear shit all over the walls of the room. Now, I am a trained counselor. That's what I do. But when I find people having severe psychotic episodes, that is not something that I really, really get into. And when we start getting to the point where we're talking about people who are possessed, which at this point in time, I believe that Taylor was possessed by some type of demon, that is way above my pay grade. So I went back into the living room with a mother and said, hey, I'm setting a doctor's appointment for you and Taylor so she can get checked out. And then we're going to do a full psychiatric screening. Her mother just kind of looked up at me with this glazed over look in her eyes and said, okay. She looked so defeated and weak. But me personally, it's time for me to get the hell out of there. A few days later, her mother took her to the doctor's office and had a full workup on her. As it was my case, I went to visit the doctor to hold a conversation with him to find out what was going on. The doctor stood there, looked me square in the eyes and said there was nothing physically wrong with Taylor. Everything was fine with her. He had recommended to her mother that she see a priest because he believed that she needed an exorcist. A week after Taylor visited the doctor, the police were called to the family's house. And Taylor was taken into custody and submitted to a psychiatric ward. Her mother had woke up at night and found Taylor standing over her with a butcher knife. She was able to fight her off and get to the phone and call 911. And when the police arrived, the officers on the scene said that she exhibited abnormal strength for a 13-year-old girl when they tried to restrain her. To this day, Taylor is staying in one of the few psychiatric hospitals remaining in the state of Louisiana. And every time she gets close to being released, she has another psychotic episode that prevents her from going home. <laughs> I will find you, and I will kill you. You, and everyone you know, will be dead. You're all going to die.
When I was 15 years old, my friends and I decided it would be cool to play with a Ouija board. To this day, I don't know why we did this. Maybe it was because we often found ourselves in the midst of trouble. Or possibly it was a constant boredom we faced growing up in a small town. Nonetheless, we arranged to trade a video game and exchange Ouija board from one of the other kids in our neighborhood. The agreement was we would have it for one week and then return it to them. None of us had ever played with one of these, so we did not take it seriously at all. The first few times we tried using it, nothing happened. On the final day when we were supposed to return it, someone decided that it would be a great idea if we took a large sheet of tracing paper from my dad's office and traced our own. That way, we could return the original and still goof around with it. The events that transpired next had been blocked out of my mind until I spoke with you this week. We decided to go to my friend's treehouse in his backyard to smoke a few cigarettes and hang out. That's when someone suggested it would be a good time to play with this homemade Ouija board. So we proceeded to ask it questions. What is your name? And the first response it spelled out was Jessica. Then we asked again, what is your name? Next it spelled out Sarah. One of my friends said, quit bullshitting us. What is your name? Then it spelled out M E L C A D O R. At this point in time, I got freaked out and decided to step away for a smoke as they continued to read the responses that came from the Ouija board. After it spelled out that name, the responses got more and more aggressive. Kill yourself. Kill your friends kill your parents. In the corner of the treehouse, I lit my cigarette, and as I took my first drag, the paper we traced the board on ignited into flames with a flash of bright light. Now freaked the fuck out, everyone decided to leave except for me. My house was only a block away, and I really wanted to smoke one or two board cigarettes before I left, so I sat there for another 20 minutes alone. Listen, at this point, I had no freaky feelings and I figured it was all good. When I climbed down from the treehouse to head home, it was about 7.15 p.m. and I had to walk down an alleyway that ran behind the houses in our neighborhood. The alleyway was 20 feet wide. On the right was a wooden fence and to the left were garages flanked by chain linked fences. There were lights that lit up the entire alleyway from one end to the other. As I walked along, up ahead of me, I saw a figure walk through the wooden fence. It was a man, about six or seven feet tall. He was wearing black pants, a black long sleeve jacket, and a black top hat. His skin was white, milk white, and his eyes were these large black voids. In his left hand was an axe, and I'm not 100% sure but I believe there was blood on the axe. He moved slowly, walking on a diagonal away from me and looked back at me over his shoulder the entire time. Man, it felt like five minutes as I stood there frozen, staring at this man. Then he walked into one of the closed garage doors. Look, I was freaking terrified. And the only way to go home was to go down this alleyway past where he was. <sighs> So I took a deep breath and hauled ass down that alleyway as fast as I could, running as close to the wooden fence as possible. When I passed the area where he disappeared, I looked back and nothing was there. Later that week, I learned that each of my friends had seen the same man. The most frightening thing was that within the next few weeks, we all would have near miss experiences that shook us to the core. At the time of Hurricane Katrina, I held a management position at the Hyatt Hotel in downtown New Orleans. The hotel is adjacent to the Superdome, where many of the people were held for over a week until they were evacuated. Contrary to popular belief, 
The levees didn't break during the storm. It was the morning after that the water came rushing into the city. The stories I'm going to share with you are not for the faint of heart, and if you are easily offended you should stop listening now. I was not aware of what was being shown on TV while the city was flooded. We were too busy dealing with people trying to find safety. However, I do remember when the military contractors arrived. These men and women were something straight out of a movie. Hardcore, combat tested, killing machines. We had been having a problem in the hotel with a man molesting and raping women while they were sleeping. He was breaking into rooms and doing some of the most horrible things you could imagine. The Hyatt had backup generators for the first few days of the storm that allowed people to move about with some light, but once they failed because of lack of fuel, things went straight to hell. Every hallway was dark, and the stairwells were deadly. The contractors searched the hotel floor by floor and room by room until they found him. Once he was identified by two of the victims, he was walked out of the side access door and we never saw him again. I won't say that they killed him, but the chances that he ran away were very slim. That same day, I went along with three of them to Gentilly, a section of the city where my house was. I wanted to see if I could salvage anything from my place, relatively safe and isolated from the horrors of the outdoor and the hotel. I had absolutely no idea of the real condition of the city. We had only made it about a mile in the boat when we ran into the first dead body, a young child floating in the water, no more than twelve years old. His body was bloated and swollen from the gases inside. A chunk of his leg was missing from some type of animal bite. On the rooftops were people everywhere begging for help. One man was standing on his roof pointing to the water. Sharks! Sharks! He shouted. When I looked over I saw three sharks swimming down the street. We traveled further. The sounds of people asking for help to this day still torture me. A woman on the roof cried out. Help! My baby is sick. Just take him with you. The contractors looked at me saying it was my decision. What was I supposed to do with a baby? I could barely feed myself. I decided to ignore her. We were passing the prison when we saw two men with guns elevated on the steps of the courthouse. They crouched down to hide, I guess expecting to ambush us and take the boat. The guys I was with simply lit the area up with gunfire. No questions, no second thoughts. For three minutes straight they lit up the area. I saw the men scramble away jumping from the steps into the water and we sped past them in the boat. At that time, I was completely over the idea of going to my house. Screw that. We arrived at Broad Street to find bloated dead bodies floating around everywhere. The smell was nauseating. I had seen enough. I began to wonder how many people did I know that were floating around the streets and I asked to go back. When we arrived at the hotel, I could only sit there. I cannot tell you the words to describe how the city felt, the smell of chemicals and death. Many people claim to know what disaster is, but until you live through something like that, you have no clue. Wait, there is one more story I would like to share with you from my time stranded at the hotel. Nighttime was the worst for everyone. We all tend to take for granted the simple things in life, like food, clean water, and working lights. However, it's the life that makes you feel safe. If you find yourself without life for an extended period of time, everything becomes frightening. Imagine this. The day after I ventured out with a team of contractors, Rumors began to spread about the things happening at the Superdome, which was less than one block away from the hotel. Now rumors doing a disaster, as I would learn later that night, should be treated as actual facts. See, you have no way of knowing what's true and what's not true. We got word that there were gangs of men roaming the area of the Superdome with guns. A little unknown secret was that ammunition was scarce during Katrina. Somehow, 
the criminals had managed to get much more ammunition than the National Guard soldiers that were there. Word was that they were going to come to the hotel and try and occupy the rooms. And this occupation was going to happen by force. So far, I have neglected to explain some things to you. You see, one face of the hotel was littered with broken windows. This was the side of the hotel that faced the corner of Porgers and Loyola Avenue, the east side. The western side did not have as much damage as there were other buildings to shelter the windows from the wind. So essentially, the eastern wing of the hotel was completely unsecured and could easily be infiltrated if a person desired to. I had a meet with several of the contractors who stayed in the hotel and asked that they patrol the eastern section. They agreed to leave two men behind to patrol the bottom two floors of the eastern section. That night, things were very quiet in the hotel. So quiet that it made me very nervous. The majority of the contractors had gone out into the night to do what they were hired to do. I choose not to share that information as I prefer not to get shot. However, there were supposed to be at least two men patrolling the eastern corridors. And of course, it was my job to check on them and see if they needed anything. So I mustered all the courage I could, grabbed my 9mm and headed over to that section of the hotel. It was 11.47 p.m. I will never forget the time because the glow of my digital watch was the only thing that provided me any light to see by. Walking the dark halls of the eastern wing of the hotel was one of the most frightening things I had done in my life. The hotel had thousands of broken windows and the wind blew through them creating this constant low moaning and whistling sound. That combined with the flapping of the curtains in the windows left me completely unnerved. In the hallway, the majority of the doors were closed, but towards the end of the hall, I knew at least one or two of them were open. I could feel a strong breeze blowing through the hallway as it created a tunneling effect, the air pushing against my chest. Halfway down the hall, I heard one of the doors open. Again, with no light other than that from my digital watch, I began to freak out. Was it one of the contractors or someone else? Man. To be real with you, I was not just scared, I was terrified. The funny thing is when you're truly scared, you forget that you have a weapon. The 9mm I had with me might as well have been a loaf of bread at that point. Somehow, I pressed on, not wanting to say anything and alert the possible bad guys to my presence or accidentally get shot by the contractors. I just walked slowly to the end of the hall. When I got to the stairwell door, Something told me, look behind me. I turned my head, and through the darkness, I could make out three silhouettes slowly moving down the hallway towards me. It was not the contractors for sure. It's only two of them. Panicking, I quickly pushed open the door to the stairwell, and the sound it made was this loud creaking and squeaking noise. I knew at that moment I had given my position away. So I bolted up the steps, to the second floor, out the door, and into the hallway. Sprinting down the hallway as fast as I could, I saw a blinding light come from ahead of me. In such darkness, that kind of light is disturbing. Then it went off. What you running for, G? Asked one of the contractors. Breathing heavily, I managed to say, Chased. First floor. Intruders. He whistled, and there was a reply from both ends of the hallway. Then he said, if shit goes left, keep your head down and get into one of the rooms. By now, you can hear movement coming from the stairwell that I had just exited, followed by the door slowly opening. The next few seconds were quiet as the dog figures made their way out of the door and into the hallway. I couldn't make out everything they said, but for sure I heard them say, we're going to find that motherfucker. After that, things erupted. The guy in front of me turned on the tactical light he had on his gun and lit up the hallway. There were four men, two with assault rifles and two had machetes. Then the contractor said something that scared the shit out of me. He looked at him and said, you can drop the weapon and leave. 
I'll walk you out. But if you don't want to walk out, we can carry you out in pieces. Legs, arms, head, hands, and torso. The words flowed out of his mouth like he was ordering coffee from Starbucks. I'm not sure if I caused what happened next, but out of fear, I opened the door to the room in an attempt to get out of the way. Then there were gunshots. I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard gunfire in a closed space like a hallway, but it's loud, deafeningly loud. But this gunfire was nothing like the gunfire on a boat. It wasn't wild and crazy. It was two successive shots. And then there was a pause. And then two more. And then two more. Inside the room, my ears were ringing so loud that it hurt. When I looked out into the hallway, the two men with the rifles were dead. And the other two men were on their knees. What are you about to do, I asked. Contractor replied, nothing. We just gonna have a talk. Then we're going to let them go so they can deliver a message to the rest of their friends. One of the men that they had on his knees had very long dreadlocks. They asked him if anyone else was in the building. For some reason, he decided to act hard and pretended he didn't hear them. That's when they grabbed a single lock of his hair, ripping it from his skull, causing his scalp to bleed and blood to run down his face as he cried out in pain. Then they ask him again, do you have anybody else here with you? He mumbled, no, no, there's no one else. They stood both of them up and said, we're letting you go. So you can spread the word that the people in this hotel are protected. And if the rest of your boys come here, they will be killed. Two men scrambled away out of the door and down the steps. That was my first and last time checking the east side of the hotel. The following day, the rumor mill was in full steam about the white boys at the Hyatt killing people. That story was spread far and wide, but I was there, and I know the real deal. It was not about black and white. If it was not for those contractors, I'd have been dead that night. It was seven days before Hurricane Katrina when I saw something so freaky that I quit my job. At the time, I was working for a man they called Little Phil Rosito at the Jester Daiquiri shop on Bourbon Street. Every building on Bourbon Street has its ghosts, shadow people, and demons. It was about 2.30 p.m. on a Thursday. The streets were semi-packed with drunken tourists. They were all talking about the hurricane headed to New Orleans bombarding me with the stupidest questions. Is the city really a bowl? How tall are the levees? Looking past this group of drunken pikers, I saw what looked like a huge shadow moved past the front door of the building. There's no mistaking what I saw. The building has huge doors that are always open. I quickly ran around the bar headed for the door. That's when I saw a second, very large shadow pass by. Peeping my head out looking down Bourbon Street, I could see two large shadow figures, at least 15 to 17 feet tall, shaped like men. The people on the street reacted to the shadows as they moved down the second block of Bourbon Street and disappeared into the walls of one of the strip clubs. I'd been told by the other bartender about the shadow people in the buildings around Bourbon Street, but that was just too much for me to handle. I told my boss, Little Phil, what I saw. He checked out the tapes and there they were, two big shadows walking down Bourbon Street in the middle of the day. Little Phil just laughed it off and said, well, it is New Orleans.
six months ago, we moved into a new house. We had outgrown our old place, and this new house was perfect. Now, in hindsight, I should have known something was off. The rent was low, the neighborhood was perfect, and it just was too picturesque. But we were in need of a blessing at this time. And so in my mind, in my family's mind, this house was a blessing to us. The day we were moving our stuff in, the guy next door came over for a chat. And during small talk, he kind of slid in the fact that no one had been able to stay in the house for more than a year. Also, that everyone who had once lived in the house left in the middle of the night. Now, before your mind begins to wonder, yes, absolutely, I found this information to be disturbing. But like I said, this house was a dream for us. I wasn't going to let the creepy neighbor scare me away. Things went well for us for about the first six months. The wife and kids were happy, and so was I. And as a hobby, I played in a beer pong league. I've been doing this for about 10, 15 years, along with my best friend, Ron. Well, suddenly, Ron fell on some hard times. Problems on the job, problems at home with his wife, and he found himself in trouble. So my wife and I opened up our home to him, for a small fee, of course. Doc Waters, remember I was telling you about some of the strange occurrences in my house? After Ryan moved in, all the strange shit started happening. Now, it would take a while before I experienced anything myself. But when I did, it was small stuff, like footsteps in the hallways, doors opening and closing on their own. However, Ron? Ron? Man, he was having issues. And it seemed like all the activity was focused on him. One morning, when my wife and I went downstairs for breakfast, we found him in the corner of the living room. Knees hugged to his chest, his eyes wide open and his blank stare and shaking. It took nearly two hours to get him to talk. And when he did, what he said was enough to get my wife and I to start praying again. You see, Ron had been lying on the sofa watching TV. And as he began to doze off, for some reason, something made him open his eyes. And when he did, there was this figure standing over him. It was jet black and his head reached the ceiling of the room and the eyes they were this fiery red color this shadow creature was solid black and it was looking away from him Ron told me that initially he thought he was dreaming so he began to wipe his eyes and as he removed his fingers from his eyes that's when it looked down at him and he heard it say what do you know about death now, of course, I thought my guy Ryan was tripping, but he insisted that this sound was not in his head and that this thing stood there looking down at him. Ryan closed his eyes again, praying that it was nothing more than a dream. And then when he opened them, it was bent over face to face with him. That's when he rolled over on his stomach, pushed his face into the sofa and began to pray. A few minutes later, he rolled back over. There was nothing there, but he could feel this presence in the room. So he moved to the corner, put his back against the wall. And that's how my wife and I found him the next morning. Knees to his chest, eyes wide open, with the sickest look of fright and fear in his eyes that I'd ever seen. After that night, my wife and I helped Ryan get an apartment and moved him out of our house. And since he's been gone, the activity has stopped. In 2003, I found myself working for the city jail and living in a very remote area. This particular night, I was driving home after working a very long double shift and getting off at midnight. It's about halfway home. I remember this strange feeling coming across me. Sure, it was foggy that night. And I'm sure the fog added on to the overall foreboding feeling that I had, but something still felt weird. As I'm driving along, I come across these three figures. You know, people I'm thinking. At least they looked like people. And they were wearing these old time robes. But they were just standing there. Literally standing in the middle of the roadway. To where they blocked both lanes. So I stopped the car. Turned on my bright lights. And looked at them. That's when one of them slowly raised his arm. Pointing at me. And I realized. That their eyes were this glowing red color. 
I was overcome with this feeling that even to this day, I find hard to describe. But the best way to put it, I felt like my life was in danger. Now keep in mind, I work at a prison, so I was armed. But I figured it was better to back up and take the long way home. When I arrived at my house, it was about 1.45 a.m. But I still had that weird feeling. By 2 o'clock, I was in bed, but I couldn't shake this feeling. Almost as if I hadn't turned around, that I would have died. The whole energy of that night was weird. My cats were doing strange things, and there was so much fog around my house at that time. When I woke in the morning, the feeling was gone. I traveled that road every night after work and haven't seen those three hooded figures since. I pray to God that I don't see them again. As for our conversation at NDA, here's the story that we discussed. As I revealed to you, I work as a remote viewer for the United States government for many years. I decided to retire from my service to our country when there were some things that I did not agree with as a patriot of the United States. Before I tell you this story, let me explain what remote viewing is and what it is not. It's not hocus pocus magic. It is channeling of psychic energy to locate a target anywhere. By anywhere, I mean any location known and unknown to man. This story is about a private case that I was paid to consult on here in New Orleans. Ahead of time, I would like to say that the details of this case cannot be shared. But what I saw during the viewing can be. A young woman went missing on Bourbon Street two days before Hurricane Katrina hit. Local and state law enforcement were in no position to locate this VIP. This young lady was from a prominent DC family, so when I received a call, I knew no expense would be spared in trying to locate her. Initially, I was unable to find anything, but after a few minutes, my mind began to get some images that were very disturbing. These images I received were not like a movie but more like still pictures that flashed in my mind. The first thing I saw was a wooded area with a large hole in the ground with smoke billowing out of it. Then a set of tracks leading deep into this underground hole. Images of a man unnaturally large and tall with his back turned to me standing at a table. His attire was old and fashioned and he was wearing some type of apron which was tied behind his neck and waist. The next image I saw was the table, long and wide, covered in blood, and would look like the intestines of a person or animal. I couldn't really tell. In his hand was a cleaver, but not a standard kitchen cleaver. This was four feet long, with a wooden handle, wrapped in gray duct tape. His hand rested on the table with the cleaver in his clutches. Then, for the first time ever in all my years of doing this work, an image flashed in my mind of him looking directly at me. The entire time I was in his environment in the underground area, but this image was at my house. Him standing there before me looking directly at me. I immediately ended this session <laughs> got up, had a glass of scotch, and smoked a cigar to relax. This was confusing to me. One, where was the girl? Two, where the hell was this place? Three, how did he know I was looking at him? In my profession, the target is always unaware of you seeing them. But he was actually aware and projected himself into my environment. This man, this man was evil and possibly psychic. An hour later, after I rested, I focused on the girl again and found myself in the same place. Images of the table, the cleaver, but she was nowhere, and neither was he. Images of chains hanging from the ceiling with shackles, a pool of blood on the floor beneath them, 
Then a table, an image of a table, it was neat and well kept, not a speck of dust or blood or anything, with a set of keys and a dog collar with the name Zeus and an address in southwest Louisiana. The information was given to the state troopers. They found a house near the bayou and inside was the most terrifying thing they had ever seen. A table with severed female body parts, hands, legs, arms. The missing girl's head was found, but nothing else. Outside in the back of the property, they found a small boat dock that extended into the wetlands and a shack. The police surmised that he was feeding the body parts to alligators in the marsh. This is one of the most horrific remote viewing sessions I've ever done. As for the man, they caught him. He was at the vet with his dog Zeus. The trooper I spoke with said that he was 6 feet 10 inches and 345 pounds. He was a true freak of nature. One of the most overlooked aspects of Hurricane Katrina was the evacuation process before the storm hit. My family left New Orleans two days before the storm landed, and it took 24 hours before we were able to get to Houston, Texas. The traffic was horrific. Millions of people in their cars on the road, trying to get away. That is the background of my encounter. We were on the road outside of Slidell, Louisiana. I was 12 years old, and after hours in traffic I had to pee. Since we were in a bushy area, my father decided to stop the car and let me pee in the bushes. I got out and walked away from the car, maybe about 15 feet into the bushes. Then I started to relieve myself. I felt a fear I've never felt since. I had the distinct sense that I was being watched. I looked at a certain bush which had long grass, and I could see glowing yellow eyes looking back at me. As I looked at the eyes, a creature stood up to reveal that it was taller than the long grass. I didn't really see what the body looked like, but I could see the outline of its head. It had pointy ears in the shape of a German shepherd. I quickly ran back to the car, peeing myself a little and jumped onto my mother's lap. She asked me what was wrong, but I didn't say anything. Clearly no one in the car saw what I saw. I decided to keep my mouth shut. It was years later as I was watching a movie called Dog Soldiers that I finally recognized what I saw. I asked a workmate of mine, who grew up in the area about such things, and he told me of legends of some sort of creature with the head of a wolf. I was saved from the roof of my house on the fourth day after Katrina hit, placed on a bus and shipped to Nashville, Tennessee, where the wonderful people of that city embraced me. I was given an apartment to stay in rent-free for six months to allow me time to get back on my feet and start working again. The apartment was extremely nice and nestled along the Cumberland River. This was the first time I had ever stayed outside of the city of New Orleans for any serious length of time, and definitely the first time I lived among such a diverse group of people. That's the background of my encounter. I'm in Nashville in an upper middle class white neighborhood. What stood out to me it's the number of children who played at the park across the street from my apartment. The sound of kids that play was something I was very familiar with. But these kids sounded much more happy than the ones back home in New Orleans. Saturday evenings were always lively. The sounds of kids playing was almost overwhelming, but in a good way. There was a knock at my door, which I figured was the maintenance man who was supposed to come install a new dishwasher. I opened the door not thinking or really paying attention and said, hey, come on in. Walking from the door into the kitchen, I got a feeling. You know the feeling you get when your body tells you something is wrong? Hair standing on the back of your neck, chills down your spine, hands trembling. It was worse than that. This was a sensation of fear, primal fear. All of a sudden, I wanted to run and hide. And everything inside of me said, don't turn around. But I had to. I had to look and see what was scanning me like this. Imagine my surprise when I turned to see a little girl at my door. 
blue jeans, and a Gap t-shirt, her head down, and hair covering her face. For a second, I felt relieved and safe. I said, hey darling, you okay? Now 10 feet away from her, with the front door still open, she raised her head, displaying her face and eyes. Her face was pale, this pale grayish white color, and her eyes were black, completely black. What had I just invited into my house? The look of those solid black eyes were like nothing I've ever seen. As I was thinking to move to slam the door in her face, she smiled, almost as if she could read my mind. She stepped into the apartment, closing the door behind her. This was all too much for my brain to process, and I fainted. When I awoke, I was still on the kitchen floor, and it was dark outside. Initially, I thought it was a dream, but I felt sick, and there was a harsh smell in the apartment, like sulfur. I pulled myself off of the floor and searched the apartment. Thought to myself, what the fuck? Confused, decided to take a shower and try and figure out what the hell just happened. The shower didn't help me relax. Actually, my blood felt like it was beginning to boil inside of me. And even though I was in the shower, my skin had this nauseating odor that reminded me of old pennies. The sickening feeling began to make my body weary, so I decided to call it a night. I was jolted out of my sleep by an unnerving feeling. My eyes were still blurry. I was still a bit disoriented in the darkness of my unlit room. I looked over at a digital clock to see what time it was. I could barely make out the time. 3 a.m. As I tried to gather my bearings, I noticed a black silhouette at the door of my room. Who was it? Was I dreaming? My questions were answered immediately when I made eye contact with the little girl as she approached the foot of my bed. Her eyes like two black holes sunk deep into her head. She smiled as she reached out, touching my foot, and then disappeared before my eyes. Since that night, I have been in and out of the hospital with various illness. My apartment began to experience strange paranormal activity. Things like objects being moved, doors opening on their own, and the reappearance of the black-eyed girl sitting on the floor watching TV. My most recent diagnosis is necrosis of the foot. And yes, it's the same foot that she touched. When I was 24 years old, I got a job working as a bouncer at a strip club, and I would always get off work real late. And by late, I mean I found myself getting home at 4.30, 5 a.m. Now, since I live with my parents, I moved into the basement. That way I could use the basement door to get direct access to my bedroom and not wake them up every time I came home. I had gotten off work at about 4 a.m., drove home, and I remember it being quiet as I pulled up outside of the house. The only sound I could really hear was the squeaking of the front right wheel on my truck. Opened the door and got out. And as I went to close the door to the truck, I heard this guttural growling sound coming from the passenger side of my vehicle. When I looked over, I saw this 9 to 10 foot tall creature standing in a creek in front of this old oak tree. And I couldn't see every detail because it was dark. But what I could see was this kind of glimmering glisten of green eyes. And also I could see a silhouette. It was massive. Then this thing growled. Man, I took off, running towards the basement door, and jumped into it. Didn't use a key. I broke the door and the lock Mardi and Gras everything else. Always been a joy Closed it behind me and moved my, my dresser door in front of me. As a kid, I remember the next thing I know, I hear this thing, thing outside throwing shit. My dad's barbecue grill, grill chairs, the home. umbrella, tables. And as a young adult, it was like this creature was my having friends a and I would often leave our parents to walk around. My parents came running downstairs, asking me, what did I do? The day these my dad looked out the basement window and saw this thing. Parades. He didn't seem surprised at all. He just told us to be quiet and it'll go away. 
We got there. The area it was jam packed. Left people right watching the parade. And stop. And now that we were away from Stand our parents, there. I literally let Rocking down my hair and started having back fun. And forth. We've been out there Looking about the 20 house. minutes or so. And I noticed a man Next, staring at me. We heard from this the loud the yell coming from far, far, far away. I'm talking about way louder than possible for any man human. staring at you. And then a creature took off back into the woods. I That's begged my dad to call the police. His eyes were locked. He said on no. He said they would only make us seem like a bunch of creepers. So we let it be. But minutes later, a float now, passed and I lost I'm track. I'm like being at home. Honestly, alone I got anymore. distracted trying to catch and some she's of the begging big my dad to sell the property. Things seemed fine, but dad won't. And when the parade got he to float number here. 32, a friend and I decided it was best that we head back to the area where our parents were. When we were walking back. I thought I caught a glimpse of him on the same side of the street as us, but I wasn't sure. But as we moved away from that crowd, I was certain that this was the same guy following us. He moved slowly, trying his best to parallel us, stay out of sight. When we were finally forced to make a right turn and walk the three blocks back to the area where my parents' house was. I noticed him for sure. And behind him was this tall black man. Now, if you ever been to Mardi Gras, you understand that crowds of people tend to create these choke points. When people stand around and bunch up talking. Well, we got to one of those areas. We were trying to squeeze past some two-lane college students when he tapped me on my shoulder and said, and said, hey, where you guys headed? My reply was short and to the point. I'm 16. Why do you care where I'm heading? You know, thinking that this creeper would realize that I was underage and going about his business. But nope, he just kept talking, so we kept walking. About a block later, we arrived at this area of sidewalk. On the left was this tall wooden fence. On the right were these kind of tall bushes. About five and a half to six feet tall. This area seemed isolated. Now people in the streets really couldn't see what was behind the bushes. And as we passed through that area, he grabbed my arm and started pulling me towards him. And just as he was pulling, I saw this black man behind him whack him across the head. Then this guy commenced to kicking and beating the crap out of him. Turns out that the guy had approached his 13 year old daughter at the parade route and he was following him just to whoop his ass. When the police arrived, which was very fast, all they saw was a black guy beating the shit out of a white guy. They immediately put the black man, whose name I learned later was Keith, in handcuffs. And when I actually explained to the officers that Keith had saved me from this guy who was trying to assault me, they let him go and arrest the other guy. But not before slamming his face into the hood of the car and saying, this is Mardi Gras. People out here trying to have fun and you fucking with their little kids? We got something for you. A few minutes later, I was back in the area where my parents were. I never told him what happened. But when I looked up that man, Keith, who came to my defense, turns out he was a pretty powerful guy. I don't think he cared about his reputation that day, though.